I love tea. Um, I drink it every day. I get, I get the privilege of starting my day in the paddocks, having a look at these beautiful hedges, and I've got the most pristine scenery that I'm, I'm walking around and looking at. And I head into the office to some of the most amazing and talented people that I've worked with. This is The Producers. I'm Danny Vallant. Other than water, tea is the most popular beverage in the world, grown extensively in China, India, Kenya, Sri Lanka and even Turkey. Australia barely factors when thinking about tea growing countries, so it's something of a surprise to learn that Narada tea in Queensland grows enough tea to make 750 million cuppers every year. Longtime employee and now managing director Tony Poyner fell into the industry but finds tea is easily interesting enough to occupy a person for several lifetimes. Uh, hello, my name's Tony Poyner and I work for Narada Tea in far north Queensland. Uh, my role here is, um, is manager and director of the, the processing and the, the production of green leaf to turn it into that beautiful Narada tea. So here on the Atherton Tablelands, um, we're bordered by World Heritage National Park. So in, it's all ex-dairy country, so it's beautiful, beautiful, rich volcanic soils. And we've got three farms or certainly two estates we own and a bit of land that we're leasing that had tea on it, which we're harvesting uh, 320 hectares or 321 hectares all year round. Uh, that produces something like well, 1.2 to 1.5 million kilos, depending on how good our season is, which is um, like three, uh, like 750 million pots of uh, cups of tea. So that's um, that's a lot of cups of tea to be drunk in Australia annually. It took a while for Tony Pointer to realise he's a country boy at heart. When he was seeking work in regional Australia, tea was initially more of a practical solution than a passion. But work at Narada soon swept him up and he became steeped in tea culture. Uh, look, I fell into the tea industry uh, some 30 years ago. Um, I'd, I'd been jumping from job to job and uh, my first son was born and I'd, I'd done a fair bit of work, you know, up and down the, the East Coast. Uh, I'd spent a time, some time in Sydney doing different work. And I finally come back to far north Queensland after reeling that, realising that I was pretty much a country boy at heart. And then I did, again, multiple jobs for a while. And I answered this ad about this new tea factory that was being built because the original Narada plantation was down at Innisfail on the coast. And they were at that stage building a new factory here off the, up on the Atherton Tablelands whereby they'd already planted some, you know, a couple of hundred acres, sorry, hectares of tea. And so I answered this ad because I sort of had to man up because my boy was just been born. I thought I was going to have to go and get a real job here. And uh, realistically, I, I, I started in, in construction of the factory and then went on to uh, commissioning and then I was working on the factory floor and – then I got into shift supervising and tea making and then assistant manager. And so the cycle went on until I spent a rather large stint then after doing manufacturing for many, many years. Uh, I took over the control of the estates and went right through the husbandry side and and then ultimately um, into the manager and director's role here in far north Queensland. So a 30-year 30 30 year history with the company but been so fortunate as to have done multiple roles within the company, which it's just never been anything but uh, a great place to be. And, you know, you look over the fence every now and again and you go, oh, no, Christ, he's really, really good. So um, it's uh, it's kept me busy and uh, it's never, never let me down. Tea has never been a major Australian industry, but commercial crops do date back to 1880. Narada's journey was something of a reclamation followed by ongoing innovation and commitment over generations. The, the Australian tea backstory is rather a tumultuous one. So, look, it started in 1880 with the Cutton Brothers down at Mission Beach. They found this parcel of land down on the coast at Mission Beach, and it was all obviously really 
horrible terrain, rainforest, you know, it, um, and they cleared this land and they had a small holding and a part of that small holding, they had tea, coffee, vegetables. So for, you know, for some 20 or 30 years, they farmed this, this, uh, this land and, you know, it's pretty wild country up here and multiple cyclones. And I think it was the second or third cyclone, um, just totally destroyed this, this, this farming land that they'd had, which had tea on it. Um, and from there they walked off the land and the, and the, and from there the story was lost for some time, um, until it was talked about, heard about. And, uh, Dr. Alan Maroof, you know, marched his way in there, trekked in there, found these tea trees because he knew what they looked like. So he was rather familiar with them. Um, and, you know, bugging me, did, if he didn't find them uh, and then produce tea plants from those original tea trees, um, and then, you know, he, he was in and out of that cycle of growing tea plants back in the 50s and the original Narada plantation down here in Innisfail uh, was actually started from, you know, from those beginnings. The, the company is, is owned by the Russell family. Um, Joan and Tristan were other people currently that, and jo- Joan's a Sydney girl. Um, I now work, and I worked for Tristan for many years. I now work for his son, John Russell. So it's a family run and owned business. Uh, and, and, you know, you just couldn't get a better family to work for. So they, you know, took over the reins of Narada many, many, many years ago, and they've done a great job in, in, innovating and and keeping it running and um, they're they're very, very good to work for. The hardy, long-lived plant, Camellia sinensis, is the basis of countless types of tea, depending on how it's grown, harvested, processed and brewed. Tony talks us through the endless permutations of tea. So people don't necessarily actually, as you say, um, think about a tea being produced in Australia. Um, we have the largest tea plantation here in far north Queensland at 321 hectares, but it's a it really is a grain of sand um, in the scheme of things because tea is the second most consumed beverage on the planet after water. So it's you know tea is steeped in history. Um, it goes back for thousands of years. There's so much tea consumed globally. It's actually phenomenal. Um, and the Camellia sinensis plant, that beautiful little tea plant produces everything from your white teas, green teas, oolongs, which is half semi-fermented, and then your black teas. And then there's every variation you can think of in between, which is harshly cut, rolled, the, you know, and, and every facet of its production can produce different characters. And then you actually have the nuances of locality, so altitude, where it's grown, soil types. So you could live multiple lifetimes and still have plenty to learn about this topic. Tea is rather a a hardy plant and realistically left to its own devices, it's actually quite nondescript. So it has a beautiful flower, but it's only a small flower. But um, the tea is very hardy. So once you've got your, your pots or certainly your small plants established for whatever you're going to grow, whether it's multiple estates or just a backyard garden, it takes three to five years before you can harvest off them. Um, They have a lifespan or a productive lifespan of 80 years if they're tended correctly. So they're a lifetime crop, which is, you know, phenomenal really. Um, So the, their length of production being 80 years, uh, and longer, I've been on plantations where I've seen tea trees being harvested at 120 years. Here, our estates, uh, probably babies in comparison, 30 years to 40 years um, in some areas, um, probably more like 30 years of age. These tea trees have quite some, some time to go. I mean, on the one estate here, we have 3 million trees. So it takes a lot of trees to produce those cups of tea because we only harvest the very top two leaves in the bud. So the Australian tea industry is rather unique because we mechanically harvest, but we're world leaders in that, in that aspect. Um, and we produce something like 7 million kilos, six and a half to 7 million kilos of, of green leaf off our estates in the season. And the season runs from six to eight months, depending on how cool it gets in winter. So 
look, it's um, it's a rather a, a, an interesting topic. The husbandry is is really quite unique. We have no pests in Australia, so we use no pesticides. Um, we have we use no fungicides. Uh, we use very very little herbicide, if any, uh, at all, because of the way we actually our husbandry, the way we grow the bushes together to produce one bowling green table. So, you know, it has no room for weed ingress. So it's fascinating. I mean, I love. I start my day on the estates every day, and and it's it's just a it's just a great place to work. Harvesting at Narada Tea is a little like painting the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Once you've finished, it's time to start again. Narada uses their own bespoke harvesters to delicately trim the tea plants, harvesting up to three tonnes of green leaves every hour. So in the harvesting season, the the bushers work on what we call a 21-day round. So each paddock is working on a 21-day harvesting cycle. So when, so when we when we go out, or when I go out in the mornings to have a look at the harvesting, because we can harvest 24 hours a day in peak season, we're looking at the cut, the leaf that's come off it, the cut height, the quality of the cut that's been left behind, because the quality of the hedge, the way it's been left, and the cleanness of the cut will dictate the amount of crop we get in another 21 days' time. So the size and the scale of the estates um, – are as such that we're harvesting 24 hours a day. And by the time we finished our three week or 21 day round, we actually start again. So it's a perpetual harvesting cycle for up to six months of the year. Um, I mean, I, I head out there, I'm looking at the cut, I'm talking with the operators. We're working within five mil increments on the top of the hedge. So we're checking that we haven't cut too low, cut too high. Um, all of that is does affect the quality of the tea that's produced, the quality of the and the quantity of the next harvesting round. So really very, very important. I mean, the harvesters were developed in far north Queensland at Gordon Vale, just down the hill. So the evolution of them over the last 30 years has been quite, quite significant. And these machines are running across the hedge at six kilometres an hour, harvesting as much as you know, three tonnes of green leaf per hour. And it's the reason that we we can stay, you know, economical within such a, uh, a varied, you know, rigorous and difficult industry where prices are quite low and the commodity price for tea is very low. So we've had to be very, very clever at what we do. The hedges are very dense and we do that on purpose. Um, the the track rows themselves we call them track rows where the machines actually enter and these machines are huge they're they're 16 feet or nearly five meters across um, and they're going in and they're taking a a very large swath in any in in their path but they're only taking off the very top tips and the hedges are very closely um, compacted so it's it's rather a unique budding cycle is what we call it. So for every every two leaf and a bud that you take off, and we've just come up 20 mil from the last harvest. So the last harvest was at, say, 1.2 metres or 1,200 millimetres. This harvest will be one uh, 1,220 millimetres. And we're, what we're doing is we're clearing the little bud that's formed. It's actually a 42-day cycle harvest in every 21 days. Sounding complicated, but 21 days for the bud to form, then 21 days for that bud to grow. So each time we cut, we take off what was actually produced as a bud 42 days before. So it's a beautiful little dance of these buds and these two leaves and the buds coming up over a th- over a 21 day or 42 day cycle. Tightly closed hedges, um, almost difficult to walk through, and unless you walk in a track row, you actually can't walk through them. But that stops the sunlight getting to the ground. It stops the weeds from germinating. It then stops us having to use chemicals. So it's a it's a very good system. So with regards to the harvesting of the the two leaves in a bud, it gets discharged or decanted from the harvester into a holding bin, which is transported to the factory on a trailer with a tractor. So these bins hold four tonnes of green leaf. They go in from there across the Weybridge. 
where they're then stacked into what's called the withering system. So to produce black tea, you need to let these two leaves in a bud sit and be aerated for approximately 12 to 20 hours, 14 hours is a, is a, is a nice number, where the enzymes in the leaf start to break down. So there's a natural decomposition or certainly changing of the chemical structure within the leaf that starts to happen. So to make black tea, that process is absolutely critical. So those compounds and all those elements start to to change in their because they've been cut from the bush, so they know that they're going through their next cycle in their in their life cycle or death cycle, whichever way you'd like to put it. Um, and then after 14 hours of withering, they enter the factory and those two leaves in the bud are then all ruptured. Every cell is ruptured. And as soon as it's ruptured, the the leaves start to oxidize. So biting an apple and leaving it on the bench and that, that browning off that happens is exactly what happens when you convert the green leaf into black tea. We do that on purpose. We rupture every cell. We cut it down to size to to produce tea bags or the pot bags, the pot tea, whichever we choose. We then oxidize it and tumble it for around an hour and a half. And in that hour and a half, all of these theoflavonoids and theorubicans, which is color and strength, and all your polyphenols and all of those beautiful compounds that that um, produce the the actual flavor and color of the tea are actually produced in that oxidization process. So, uh, and it has to be done at 68 to 70% moisture. So the moisture is critical. The temperature is critical, 26 to 30 degrees, hour and a half, so 90 minutes. And then we put it into the dryers and we, we dry them over an 18-minute drying cycle, which is quite critical as well because you want to remove water but not volatiles. Um, and then we discharge out of the dryers um, at 3%. We don't dry it completely because those last 3% is your volatiles and your oils and your cup strength. And then we sift it, sort it into its different sizes, into bulk bags here in far North Queensland before transporting to Brisbane to the packaging factory where it's packaged and distributed nationally. Tea connoisseurs will often tell you tea bags are inferior. But is that right? Narada produces leaf tea and tea bags. What's the difference between the tea that's used for the two brewing methods? With regards to tea, there's a common misperception that tea bags is the sweepings off the floor. So it's been a it's been around in our culture for as long as we can remember that it, that tea bags are an inferior quality product. I mean, nothing could be further from the truth, actually. Um, they're both, it's all the same. Two leaves in the bud get ruptured. They get cut to size in our factory by our machines called CTCs, which stand for cut, tear, and curl. Um, and that then is all oxidized at the same time at the same rate, dried at the same rate. And then some very clever and l- rather large sorting equipment sifts it to its different grades which then there's a packing element which is the weight so we have to grade it to the correct sizing and weight so that it can go into the packets which is very important because that comes back to leaf quality as well Um, so the difference between tea bags and leaf tea is really truly just the size that it's been screened to Um, so that, that really is it in a nutshell. It's not all tea and biscuits. Narada faces some of the cost challenges that are common to all primary producers, as well as some that are specific to tea. The challenges are all of our major inputs are expensive. So fuel, labour, electricity, um, you know, all of the compliance models we have to abide by are all very, very expensive. The Our secret to success, and, and it gets tougher every year and we just have to find more ways to innovate, uh, is the fact that we still, we still get realistically very, very low prices. I mean, tea coming into the country is, is produced around the world. So, you know, all of the teas that you, we're competitive against are imported. And they come in at rock bottom prices, and 
you know, look, I'm I'm no I'm no angel. I, I like to buy specials and I like to go and, and save a dollar where I can. But you know, when it comes to what's being purchased, uh, Narada is produced in Australia. It's a quality product. It's very very difficult to compete price wise against uh, imports. Um, and in, and it's at this stage that I'd urge everyone to actually have a look at the packet and have a look at where things are produced. You know, if you're interested in purchasing Australian made and a very good quality and fresh product that's pesticide free, um, it's a, it's a good choice. But uh, have a look at your packet and just have a look at where things are produced, and I think you'd be you'd be shocked at where a lot of these things are coming from. Tony Pointer has worked in just about every aspect of Narada's business from farm to factory, and of course, to cup. But what is it that keeps him engaged and passionate about his work in tea? Uh, I, I I like, for me personally, it's the diversity that I have within my role, uh, everything from trade track management through to husbandry, and then everything, you know, with regards to, to people and logistics in between. But the tea industry, it's just, it's romantic. It's you know, you're taking these most amazingly beautiful bushes that are there with you for a lifetime. You're taking off this beautiful fresh growth. You're handling it with kid gloves. You're turning it in from something into something really special that needs to be like a, making a beautiful recipe, has to be done properly every day. And then turning it into a very special product that, you know, millions of people can, can enjoy. Uh, you know, 750 million cups, proudly produced and enjoyed in Australia every year. Look, I love it. I love tea. Um, I drink it every day. I get I get the privilege of starting my day in the paddocks, having a look at these beautiful hedges, and I've got the most pristine scenery that I'm, I'm walking around and looking at. Then I head into the office to some of the most amazing and talented people that I've worked with, um, all have ver- a variety of a bows to their string. Uh, in the tea industry, people just have to be good at a multiple of different things because it's a seasonal industry in a rural community. So, you know, you're, you're drawing on a lot of strengths from these people. Um, and then I walk in and I'm getting to taste yesterday's manufacturing. So, you know, there's 20 teas sitting on the table, which is core samples of the teas produced the day before. I get to taste those every day you know, take a sample home of the nicest teas on the table. One of the tricks, though, is to ensure that every one of those samples tastes exactly the same. Uh, And that's the skill of the tea makers that we have in the factory. Uh, They iron out all of those nuances, those differences, those night manufacturing and those day manufacturing, and they just tweak the, the, the factory just to produce the same quality of cup every day, day in and day out. But no, look, very fortunate. I, um, I work with some amazing people in an industry where we don't have to use chemicals, where it's a pristine environment and realistically couldn't be luckier. Narada Tea has just celebrated 50 years in business. It's an Australian success story in a field that isn't necessarily thought of as an Australian industry. Tony Pointer is glad to play his part in a family company that farms, harvests and packages a homegrown product, confident that three quarters of a billion great cups of tea are enjoyed through his labour every single year. This is The Producers, a Deep in the Weeds production. I'm Danny Vallant. Stay tuned as we talk to some of Australia's best farmers, makers and growers. Follow us on Instagram at Producers Podcast or contact us via deepintheweeds.com.au.